I'm Virginia Trioli from ABC TV, delighted to be here for the 2013 Festival of Ideas at the University of Melbourne. This is course session two, eating ourselves to death. What a luxury we have in Western affluent countries that we can die eating that we can die from simply too much food. That's what we're going to kick around this morning with a fantastic panel of guests. I'm going to cut through all the preamble and the introductions. Uh, I acknowledge the, the traditional owners of our land and I urge you to go and visit the um, Bunjil desk downstairs. But with that, can we please um, welcome and introduce our first speaker, Jennifer, Jeffrey Anderson, who's the Deputy CEO of Health, Nutrition and Scientific Affairs at the Australian Food and Grocery Council. Uh, he has worked with Goodman Fielder and also has extensive knowledge of current industry issues, particularly in the technical challenges in food science, nutrition and health. His extensive experience in food regulation and innovation, he's held a number of senior technical and management roles in industry, academia and public policy. Like the other speakers this morning, he'll speak to you briefly, then we'll have a Q&A session at the end of that. Geoffrey Anderson. Oh, well. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I do apologise for holding up the proceedings slightly. I was enjoying a very nice lunch at the, uh, at the invitation of the university. I didn't realise quite that the timings were so short. However, um, I will get straight into what I want to say to you. I am the Deputy Chief Executive of the Australian Food and Grocery Council, a national organisation representing Australia's uh, food manufacturing sector. Uh, we're a trade association, we're a lobby group, we're advocates for the food industry, uh, we're a collective forum for uh, activities that the food industry might, uh, might wish to pursue. Of course, the food manufacturing sector in Australia represents about, um, well, it's the largest manufacturing sector, it's about three times the size of the motoring uh, or rather the automotive manufacturing sector, it contributes about 20% uh, of the total GDP earned from the manufacturing sector. So it's Australia's largest manufacturing sector, has about 200,000 employees and indirectly probably employs about 800 to 900,000 people. So it's a big industry by any, um, by, well, by any measure really. And of course, because it's a big industry, government policy that affects the industry uh, and any action really that affects the industry has the potential to affect um, us not only on an economic level, but of also because of the fundamental role that food plays in our, in our lives, both in terms of providing us with nutrition, which is obvious, but also the cultural and recreational and social roles that, uh, that food and nutrition play. Now, I could bore you for a long period of time about the history of the food industry and its role in preventive health, which I know is uh, one of the interests of this festival of ideas. I could talk, for example, about the fact that in 1880, in London, the cry used to go out, typhoid follows the milkmaid. And of course, that was because milk from cows is actually potentially quite a dangerous product. It's high in water, it's high in nutrients. If you don't handle it correctly, it can be very dangerous. It, it can become a vehicle for typhoid. In fact, when I was doing food technology at the University of New South Wales, um, I tempted to say Australia's greatest university, but perhaps not in, in this particular forum, um, we were told that there were at least half a dozen illnesses that, were, um, that could be vectored through milk. Now, of course, since typhoid followed the milkmaid in the 1880s, of course, we now look upon milk as one of the safest of food products, and indeed it is. There are very few food poisoning or food illnesses associated with milk in Australia now. And it's really because of the intervention of technology and really extremely advanced technologies, which most consumers, most of the time, are completely unaware of. The food industry did this not only with milk, but they did it with a whole range of other um, products. So that by the time we reached uh, the mid part of the last century, um, food was to all intents and purposes um, safe. Of course, not safe all of the time, but a hell of a lot safer than it had been 100 years earlier for most people in the developed world. But of course, after the 1950s, if you like, as we went into the latter half of the last century, the food industry started to respond to advances in nutritional science 
And you saw such things as in the 1970s, polyunsaturated margarines coming onto the market at the behest of the medical community who were beginning to relate saturated fat and unsaturated fat with levels of cardiovascular disease. By the 1980s, following the thesis of Burkitt and the, diet, the famous dietary fibre thesis, the fibre levels in, in um, breakfast cereals were going up. And of course, as we, by the time we got into the 1990s, and uh, in case you're wondering, I remember all of these decades quite well. Um, by the time we got into the 1990s, we started to see back to the dairy cabinet, not just skim milk and full cream milk, but a whole range of different milks that had been modified in a certain way at, well, really responding to advances in nutritional science. But of course, as we went into the current century, um, the obesity debate caught up with us. Now, I've been with the food and food industry for a long time, both with the researcher with the CSIRO. I've run nutrition and health departments in universities, and I'm now um, an advocate for the food industry, and particularly the science and technology that the food industry does. By the time we got into the 20th, or no, the 21st century, um, the obesity crisis had caught up. Now, we always knew the relationship between food and health at this level of calories in and calories out, or energy in, energy out. Previously, during the 1990s, the food industry had a position of saying, we have always provided choice, and indeed it was true. In the 1990s, you could buy low fat, low energy, low salt, low sugar products, just as you can now. But by the time the 1990s came along, the food industry was realizing that it was time at the behest of the medical community and the public health sector to refine its food products, and so even the mainstream food products, we began to see reformulation. So, for example, in, uh, in 2003, it was reported in the scientific literature that Kellogg's had taken um, or reformulated all of its breakfast cereal in Australia to take sodium out of breakfast cereal to the tune of, uh, I think it was 234 tonnes per annum of salt no longer being consumed in Australia because of that across the board reformulation. And you can look at almost any food company now, particularly the multinationals, but it's not just the multinationals that are doing this, who are constantly reformulating their products, both to make variants, to um, promote to uh, particular subgroups of the population, but also to alter the levels of risk-associated nutrients in the food supply for Australian consumers. And those are facts. However, what's really happened in the food industry over the last 50 to 60 years? What has really happened? First of all, I would like to tell you that the food industry, the primary role of the food industry, is we transform. We transform foods through time, we transform them through space, and we transform them through form. We transform them through time, through storage. So we make available to you, the consumer, food products out of season. We transform them through space because, believe it or not, most of us do not wish to drive to the back of Narrabai to get a kilo of wheat so we can have a breakfast cereal in the morning. We bring the foods to you and we transform them through form. And most of the time we do it in order to make them more nutritious. We don't eat wheat, we don't eat cattle, and we don't actually drink raw milk. No, we eat bread and biscuits and pastas from wheat. We eat steaks and meat pies, and some of us are lucky enough to have a steak and kidney casserole. We also have milk, which is pasteurized, and cheeses and yogurts that have gone through a process. And in many cases, these foods are not only more wholesome and safer, they are more nutritious than they would be otherwise if you were going out and getting them yourself, and they are more affordable. And you guys, you Australian consumers, to some extent encouraged by the food industry, take it all for granted. But let me put two scenarios to you, which I would like to just, for you to just test for a moment. Imagining that you were coming to my house for dinner, for some of you, that might not sound like a very exciting proposition. 
if you were coming to my house for dinner and I put out a meal on the table and I told you, well, let's not, we don't have to even imagine what the details of the meal are, but if I told you it cost me uh, $5.50, I went down to the supermarket, it came pre-packaged, I was able to um, uh, prepare it in the microwave, so I spent uh, 20 minutes doing it, um, and, uh, and that's essentially how I presented it to you. Now, you may be impressed with that, or you may not, but, if, but compare it if I invited you to dinner and I put food on the table, which was essentially the same as in the first scenario. But the second scenario, scenario is I've grown the vegetables in my own garden. I've got a relationship with the local butcher, which means that we only source meat from a farm 35 kilometres up the road, which is prepared organically. And the whole cost of the meal, if I factor everything in, was $55. And by the way, it took me from 8 o'clock this morning until 6 o'clock tonight to prepare it. Now, the foods can be exactly the same in both scenarios, in terms of the safety, in terms of the nutrition they provide, in terms of how they taste. But I suspect that you would think that there was more value under the second scenario. Do you have two minutes? Ten. Two. two. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not sure I can talk for another ten. Um, and the, my, my hypothesis is that you don't, you consumers, and I'm sure some of you don't necessarily fall into the, you don't quite understand the value that is actually now being provided to you as consumers by the food industry. You don't have to worry about growing your food. You don't have to worry about the safety of it. And for a large proportion of you, you probably don't even have to worry about the cost of it. The average Australian spends sometime, somewhere between 12 and 15% of their disposable income on food. At the end of the last war, it was near 50%. So the food industry has done great things. And in all of this time, it's almost gone unnoticed by the population to the extent that the food industry is now facing its own crisis, and it's not just the obesity crisis, it's the crisis of the food industry itself being attacked on the basis that it doesn't, still, it doesn't seem to meet the value propositions that many consumers want, certainly not as they are played out in the common media. So my hypothesis, and I realise I've gone through this without any slides, was there a clicker? Um, is that you should cherish your food industry for what it has provided and for the lifestyle assistance that it has given to you as Australian consumers and which you'll continue to enjoy for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thanks, Geoffrey. Um, Mike, is there a clicker that people have or need to use? It's this one, just if you... Guys, for your presentations, there's your clicker if you need it. Thanks so much. I just want to um, uh, mention to you that uh, you can tweet throughout our session today, and we have a tweet moderator sitting here in front of me. Hello. Here's my barrel girl. Um, and the, uh, the hashtag is uh, UOMFOI. University of Melbourne Festival of Ideas, U-O-M-F-O-I, that's all one word, hashtag, and uh, we'll read out some tweets, uh, if they're good enough, I've been told, only if they're good enough, so, you know, lift your act, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll read them out as well. There'll be um, deliberative uh, polling at the end of this too, but I'll talk you through that once I've figured it out myself. Um, Jay Martin joins us now. She's the Executive Manager of Alcohol and Obesity Policy at the Cancer Council Victoria. Uh, she leads the Obesity Policy Coalition, and that's a partnership between Diabetes Australia Victoria, the Cancer Council Victoria, the Victorian Health Promotion Foundation and the WHO Collaborating Centre for Obesity Prevention at Deakin University. Having worked in tobacco control for about 20 years, she saw that the processed food and advertising industry uh, were targeting children using similar marketing techniques to big tobacco. So she now uses her experiences of fighting big tobacco, she says, to fight big food through the Obesity Policy Coalition, which should make her conversation with Geoffrey later on really interesting. <laughs> Jay Martin. Thank you, Virginia, and um, I'm really thrilled to be here at 
in Melbourne University, the university that my dad says, who is an academic but not here, the best university in Australia. So I'm very proud and pleased to be a part of this festival of ideas. And one of my funders, Vic Health, is also a partner. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, clicker. Now, doesn't she look like me? <laughs> this isn't me when I was young. This is my daughter. And like all parents, I wanted her to grow up healthy and content, and particularly to have healthy habits. And over the years, I realised what a challenge that this was going to be. Um, and when she was small, like a lot of parents, I didn't let her watch any commercial TV. She was, you know, she could watch the um, ABC. But when she was two years old, she said to me, purple is chocolate. I thought, oh, how did that happen? That is just amazing. Um, go Cadbury. Um, and then I thought, no wonder went, they went to such an effort to protect the brand purple. I mean, that's what my daughter at two had got from it. And I'm not saying she's a genius or anything. Um, but what really challenged me as she grew up was the triumphant basketball series run through her school. Um, her primary school, and she won it, her team won, and it was so thrilling, she was so excited. And she got vouchers, she got a t-shirt, there was a certificate, and a team celebration. And on the surface, this doesn't sound like anything that should concern a parent. Um, you know, a child winning a team event with her school basketball team, through, run through Basketball Victoria. But for me, the problem was, that it was a partnership with McDonald's. The T-shirt was a size 16. She was a tiny little thing. I think she's actually still got that T-shirt. Um, and uh, the voucher was redeemed at McDonald's. And what could I say? She couldn't go and celebrate at McDonald's. What kind of parent would that make me? So they did. And how did that make my child feel about McDonald's? Well, she thought they were awesome. And this is in line with research. Of course she did. 85% of children surveyed in one study thought that food and beverage companies who sponsor sports, help out sports clubs, want to return the favour and buy the sponsor's products. It's very unethical and confusing for children, um, the nature of these promotional messages embedded in sport. Um, and the involvement in junior sport doesn't involve opportunities to introduce children to these brands and their products, but also builds goodwill amongst the other participant parents and observers. My aspirations for my children aren't any different from anybody else's. We all want to have healthy, happy children. They're our future. In fact, a society is judged on how they treat their children. So imagine a situation where one in four children weren't immunised, or 25% of children were taking up smoking. How would we feel about that as a society? What would our response be? We'd be incredibly concerned. And yes, we have a problem of similar size to this. 25% of our children are overweight or obese. It's not as simple as... Um, it's not as simple as immunisation, but it is very similar to tobacco smoking. So we need to take the same approach. Children in this category are more likely to go on to be overweight and obese as adults and develop all the health problems. These young children are also developing health problems. And another element is the bullying that goes on at school and the teasing, which is sort of acceptable in our community, which is another very damaging element. Unfortunately, much of the problem rests with what our children are eating. We know that one of the key drivers of poor diets and a cause of overweight and obesity is the marketing of unhealthy food. The idea that children are harmed by unhealthy food advertising is not radical and it's not new. Peak international and Australian health bodies have openly called for children's exposure to this kind of marketing to be reduced. And the World Health Organization has specifically called on member states to make children's settings, including sport, free of this sort of marketing. The AMA in Australia and other public health groups have also called on successive governments over many years to control the television advertising of unhealthy food. Many other countries have taken steps to protect, our children, protect their children, but Australia lags behind. And here a lot of the responsibility rests on parents like me, and industry is basically left to regulate itself. 
Food companies would not market to children if it didn't work. We have strong, uh, large-scale reviews of the evidence, including by the World Health Organization, which show that marketing of food to kids does work. It influences the type of foods children want to eat, it, it influences what they demand from their parents and others, and it contributes to poor diets, weight gain and obesity. Increasingly, in the last few decades, children and young people represent a primary market for these integrated, well-funded initiatives, spending hundreds of millions of dollars with marketing and advertising, increasingly moving into the digital space. Australia has been shown to have one of the highest rates of unhealthy food marketing on television um, in the developed world, and many, many of the, of the foods advertised are non-core, so they're not really required in the diet. And at children's peak viewing times in highest rating programs like The Simpsons and The X Factor, they're aired repeatedly. So with huge budgets, the techniques to draw in young audiences are getting increasingly sophisticated. How can you guard your child against the influence of an Oreo cookies advertisement? An advertisement with three little pigs, an animation of three little pigs, a big bad wolf, and invites them to imagine what happiness could be achieved if they shared an Oreo. So it's making friends and having fun. This advertisement was said not to be directed to children by the self-regulation watchdog. <laughs> How do you stop the influence of a cool summertime share a Coke advertising being posted by your kids' friends on Facebook? Or about, what about your kids' new obsession with the Chupa Chup app or the Fanta app on Dad's iPad? Promotions such as this make it even harder for parents who are not looking over their children's shoulders and they're engaging in advertising dressed up as entertainment. However, much of this does go on in full view of parents. And how do they take this on? What can we do? Parents across Australia, like me, are going through the same frustration and powerlessness, trying to support their children to grow up healthy and active with balanced diets, but the playing field is not even. We see the level of concern and the passion of parent power every day. They're coming up with innovative people power campaigns to keep their children's activities free from this kind of corporate influence. One parent has started a position to get McDonald's out of little athletics. Daniel O'Brien of Upway, um, who my daughter says, she's your sister, mum. <laughs> grew tired of seeing the little um, the McDonald's logo plastered on her children's um, uniforms in the training programs and on the team website. She then spoke to other parents at the club and found that many felt exactly the same about little athletics. And then as the, um, her concern went broader, she found that parents were also concerned about Auskick and the basketball being sponsored by McDonald's. So she started a petition on change.org, currently with 12,500 signatures. So it's interesting to watch this resistance emerge about corporate sponsorship of sport by unhealthy food companies. And one of the defences used by these companies is that the responsibility is on parents to oversee their children's diets. But I don't think this, would count, this parental action would count as something that they would encourage. I think a lot of you here will have heard about Tacoma. Um, rising up about a VCAT allowing um, McDonald's to put an outlet opposite a school and down the road from a childcare centre. Um, a large campaign has been run by the community about this moving into the international and national arena. I know this isn't just about health, but it is one of the community's concerns. And this petition on change.org has 100,000 signatures. Thank you. McDonald's is feeling the heat, evidenced by their response in Tacoma, which has been to move into the community, offering sponsorships to sports and schools and helping to improve their image as a good corporate citizen. And in an environment where schools and sports clubs are increasingly finding it difficult to survive and thrive, it's very difficult for them to turn money away. But there are some alternatives. One father, Aaron Schultz, has taken up the issue more broadly working to address gambling, alcohol and junk food sponsorship in sport through a um, campaign called Game Changer. When his local footy club was approached by Maccas, he challenged the committee to use their connections to raise funds by selling signage on the Oval at $500 a pop and in fact raised much more money than Maccas was offering. He's now got a top Game Changer at sponsoring a top ranking world rally driver who now goes out to speak to school students about alcohol, gambling and junk food sponsorship in sport and that they don't mix 
I'm sure there are many other corporates out there whose values would align well with sport and we should encourage them to get engaged in junior sport. Yes, parents do have a role, but increasingly their, their influence is being undermined. I've only talked to you today about a few of my experiences and the experience of others, but many parents with many fewer resources uh, have much bigger issues to manage than their children's pester power. In fact, families who are most disadvantaged in our society are the ones most likely to be overweight and obese, as are their children. Thanks. My prop... Um, It's not enough to sit by and watch food and advertising industry do the right thing to our children. We need to do more. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. And Jane's proposition, which we'll all get to um, vote on later on, is we should provide incentives for junior sport to stay free of sponsorship from unhealthy food and drink companies. Now, the genetics of obesity, according to Professor Joe Proietto. Now, um, Joe is the, uh, is the Professor of Medicine at University of Melbourne. He's the inaugural Sir Edward Dunlop Medical Research Foundation Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine, Austin Health at the University of Melbourne. He's a scientist and clinician investigating the genetic and biochemical causes of obesity and type 2 diabetes. He established one of the first obesity clinics in a Victorian public hospital at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. He's published over 100 articles, book chapters and books on obesity and diabetes. He's an editor and reviewer of a number of international scientific journals. He's an eminent panellist and speaker today. Please welcome Joe Proietto. Thank you, Virginia. So the question is, what causes obesity? Dante Alighieri, who, for those of you who don't know, is to Italian what Shakespeare is to English, thought he knew the answer. As you know, Dante's great work was his journey through the afterlife that he wrote in poet form, poetry form, where he traveled through heaven, hell, and purgatory. And when he was in hell, he met a man called Chaco, who was in hell because he was a glutton. You can read there, the name you citizens gave me was Chaco, and for the damning sin of gluttony, as you can see, I languish in the rain. Now, those of you who are not familiar with Catholic theology would not know necessarily that to go to hell, you have to commit a mortal sin. So being fat is a mortal sin. But more particular for this discussion, to commit a sin, you have to exercise free will. So people who are fat choose to be fat. They choose themselves to be fat. Now, most people in the world now agree with Dante, not necessarily to send him to hell, but agree that it is a self-choice to become obese. But I'd like to show you that it's really not as simple as all that. Now, we know, we know that twins often look the same. Twins nearly always are the same size. If, you're, if they're skinny, they're skinny. If they're fat, they're both fat. And it used to be believed that this was because they were brought up in the same lifestyle. They lived in the same house. They went to the same school. They ate the same food. They did the same sport. They wore the same silly clothes. But in fact, in a study published in 1999, they found, they looked at the correlation coefficient, how close twins were together. Non-identical twins were, were similar, correlation coefficient 0.3. However, identical twins were much more similar, correlation coefficient 0.7. So far, so good. But then they found a whole bunch, tragically, a whole bunch of identical twins that had been separated at birth they never met each other. They were brought up in different families. Do you know what their correlation coefficient was? 0.7. It made no difference where they were brought up. And then we have this study from Claude Bouchard, who locked up 12 pairs of identical twins in the Quebec bush. He paid them a lot of money, and he overfed them by 1,000 calories a day in excess. 
And here shown on this slide is fat gain in one twin versus fat gain in the other twin. And what you notice is that the twins track together. If one twin didn't put on much fat, neither did the other one. If one twin put on a lot of fat, so did the other one. So the amount of weight you gain if you're force fed depends on your genes. And then we have adoption studies. We have adoption studies where they looked at people who'd been adopted and asked the question, do you resemble the family, the, the parents that brought you up, that fed you? No, there's no relationship between adopted people and their adoptive parents. But yes, there is a statistically significant relationship with the biological parents you've never met. And hence, the power of the genes over the environment in obesity. Now, we know that in 1980, 7.1% of the Australian population was obese. In 2000, that had jumped to 18.4%. So people who study these things, when I say it's obesity is genetic, they say, how can you explain that? Genes do not change that fast. Mutations occur at a slow rate. There is no way that obesity can be genetic, but there is, there is. Now you all know that genes code for proteins, and it's true, mutations don't happen that fast. But a new phenomenon, it's not so new now, but a re relatively recent phenomenon, is this phenomenon of epigenetics. And in epigenetics, an environmental trigger can alter the expression of a gene. So the environment can cause a gene to be switched off or switched on permanently. And this is by doing chemical modification of the promoter of a gene that regulates the gene expression or the proteins that wrap the genes up, the DNA. And there's evidence that obesity can be epigenetic. In this study, they showed that if your mother goes through a famine while you are in utero, especially if you're in utero in the first trimester, you will grow up to be obese. The fetus somehow is imprinted. If mother is starving, the fetus is imprinted to become fuel efficient and hungrier for the rest of his life. Isn't nature wonderful? To prepare you for a harsh environment. This happened, this was shown in Holland. Holland during the Second World War went through a famine. But when the environment is not, is not harsh, you're still left with more hunger and more, more efficiency in your biology. But more important, not a, while most epigenetics occurs in utero, some can occur after birth. And, I, and I'll show you this here in this complicated slide. I only want you to focus on the top two lines. This is a study conducted in rats. In the black squares uh, is the growth curve of rats fed a healthy, low-fat chow. And rats grow most of their lives. They grow bigger. In this, in the line, in this line with the black diamonds, the rats were fed a high energy diet from weaning, from the age of three weeks. They were given a diet that was 8% corn syrup and 42% sweetened condensed milk. And you, you would you'd guess that they would really like that, right? It's nice and sweet. So they put on weight. They put on weight compared to the controls. So far, no surprises. If you eat, eat high energy food, you'll put on more weight. But at this point here, the rats were divided into two groups. One group continued on the high energy diet. The other group was switched to low fat chow. They were also food restricted. They were put on a diet. They, they weren't given as much of this healthy food so that they lost weight. So this group lost weight. You can see this in the open circles. Down back to the weight of the controls. And from then on, they were only fed an, a low-fat diet, the healthy diet, and, but as much as they wanted to eat. And look what they did. They became fat again on the healthy food. So 
the, the obesity had become permanent, provided there was no deficiency of food. So this is probably as a result of epigenetics. So the way that food makes you fat is not only by giving you more calories, but by potentially also changing your gene expression. Now, how does the body do this? How did those rats know to go back to that level? Now, to understand that, you have to understand body weight regulation. And unfortunately, it's very complicated. Weight is regulated in the hypothalamus, which is down here. And all of this goes on in the hypothalamus. And I, you'll be happy to know I won't cover all of it. I know. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> In the, in the arcuate nucleus, which is a little part of the hypothalamus, there are two types of nerves. One type makes you hungry, the other type takes your hunger away. And, and whether you want to eat or not depends on which of these nerves is working the most. So the question is, at any one time, which nerves is working and furthermore, what controls the activity of these nerves? And what controls the activity of these nerves are hormones that circulate in the blood. Now, because I haven't got much time, I'll just tell you that there are more than 10 of these hormones in the blood that regulate hunger. But there's only one that makes you hungry, this one, ghrelin, and all the others take hunger away. Now, we, we did a study that we published in 2011 where we looked at the levels of these hormones after people lost weight. So the, the paper is titled Long-Term Persistence of Hormonal Adaptations to Weight Loss. We got people to lose weight and we measured those hormones before weight loss, at the end of weight loss, and at the end of, uh, and a year later. And basically what we found is that the hunger hormone went up and stayed up, and these hormones went down and stayed down even after a year. And this is the reason why diets fail. This is why it's so hard to maintain weight loss. So just to conclude, the way obesity should be viewed is demonstrated by this analogy. If you take two pots, one 100 litres, another 30 litres, and you put them outside in your back garden and you leave them there, and overnight it rains like it's been doing in Melbourne, it rains heavily. And when you come back the next morning, you find that this pot is holding 100 litres. And you say, you ask the question, is this pot holding 100 litres because it rained last night? The answer is yes. That's the same question as asking, is this man obese because of the environment? Yes. But that's not the reason why it's holding 100 litres. It's holding 100 litres because it was made a big pot. Thank you very much. <laughs> I love the big pot analogy. I know a lot of people who would relate to that. Any tweets that you'd like to share with us, Chief Tweeter? Uh, yeah, sure. So we had a um, question for Jeff. Can we hear him? We need the mic. Run, run, run. <laughs> it's good for you. <laughs> yeah, so we had a question for Jeff, which was, uh, it's one thing to make milk safe to drink, thank you, but how does filling it with sugar and flavourings make it healthier? Okay. Yes. No, you can't answer that now. <laughs> you can take that, take that uh, we'll table it and we'll get to it later on. Remember that one for me if I forget. Let's move on to Professor Mike Daub now, Professor of Health Policy at Curtin University. He's a cheery bloke. He's entitled his talk today, Why Action on Obesity Will Fail. <laughs> Why are we here? He's a professor of health policy at Curtin University where he's director of the Public Health Advocacy Institute and the McCusker Centre for Action on Alcohol and Youth. He's president of the Australian Council on Smoking of health and Health, co-chair of the National action Alliance for Action on Alcohol, chair of the WA Network of Alcohol and Other Drugs. You get the picture. He's been a leader in tobacco control and public health for four decades. He's here to cheer us up. Mike Daub. Thanks, Virginia. No slides, which for an academic is a bit like Lance Armstrong without a pharmacist. <laughs> 
We sometimes hear that obesity is the new tobacco, but 63 years after definitive evidence that smoking kills, the global tobacco industry still flourishes, each year selling six trillion cigarettes, causing six million deaths. But in Australia, we have seen a dramatic decline in smoking in both adults and kids. There was no rocket science about what happened. A comprehensive approach, including mass media, legislation, and product controls. There was early resistance, not least from health systems focused on treatment and clinicians who didn't understand prevention. We had to convince those who thought cessation programs for individuals and occasional school lectures were the answer. We were criticized because some approaches didn't work overnight. We even faced resistance from researchers and others who argued that nothing should ever be done for the first time. <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite slides, no, don't laugh, I've only got 10 minutes. One of, <laughs> one of my favorite slides shows a banner displayed by researchers at a protest rally. It says, what do we want? evidence-based change. When do we want it? After peer review. <laughs> <laughs> Crucially, we faced opposition from a large, powerful industry determined to deny the problem, delay action, propose ineffective solutions, run its own education programs, shown by research to be useless and probably counterproductive, oppose anything that might reduce sales and keep selling as much as possible as lethal products to anybody it could target. Adults, the young, vulnerable populations. How different is obesity? We know there's a problem and it's growing globally. Authoritative health reports have made clear recommendations about the action we need, not identical to tobacco, but a similar mix of public education, legislation, and product control. But we're fat and we're getting fatter. In this wonderfully advanced society with one of the best healthcare systems in the world, for the first time in history, our kids face a shorter life expectancy because of obesity. If tobacco is hard, obesity will be harder. Obesity, at least in part, is a byproduct of an affluent, car and screen dominated society. We can afford to eat more. We're time poor. We travel by car. We drive our kids to school. We live in environments that support driving, not physical activity. And for parents and kids alike, screen based activity often offers more exciting leisure prospects than walking, running, or cycling. Health and physical education isn't a priority for schools, not even up there with the arts in the top two mandatory tiers of the new national curriculum. Junk food and drinks are cheap, accessible, easy, and tasty. Snacks and aren't apples and oranges. They're commercial products laden with salt, sugar, and fat available anywhere targeted to children. The processed and junk food and drinks industries are massively more powerful than health groups or the fresh fruit and vegetable industries. Junk and other forms of prepared food are brilliantly promoted through every possible medium. Much of this clearly directed to kids. We have Generation J, the junk food generation. If you believe the promotions, though, junk food brings, brings us all the good things. Cadbury's brings, Cadbury brings us Joyville and Joy. McDonald's brings us summer. Coke brings us happiness. <laughs> the industry's lobbying programs, as you've heard, emphasize their size and power. Even inside governments, food policy is led not by health departments, but by departments like industry and agriculture, whose main concern is for the health of manufacturers and retailers. Advertising for junk food is uncontrolled. The voluntary codes are feeble, loosely worded, limited in scope, poorly enforced, and have no penalties. Sports organizations and departments should support healthy lifestyles, but instead promote the joys of alcohol, junk food, and gambling. Whether it's Carlton promoting Mars or Cricket's KFC Big Bash, many of our leading sports people who could be role models are mobile billboards for junk food. Commercial activity to help people lose weight makes a minimal contribution. There are surgical options, but even measures such as bariatric surgery aren't without risk and are not population approaches. Research tends to focus on almost anything other than what will actually reduce obesity. A year or two ago, I reviewed around 300 NHMRC-funded projects on obesity, and even at a generous estimate, I reckon half a dozen would have had any impact on public policy or community health over the next 50 years. And some seem to have almost a vested interest in making the problem look even more complex and implying that it isn't susceptible to public health and policy responses. I respect and support the work of people in treatment and colleagues in the research arena, we need more Joes, but what they do is that. It's treatment and research, neither of which should be confused with prevention. There's very little tough public education, the kind that makes an impact, like the forceful tobacco media campaigns that did so much both to reduce smoking and to convince legislators that they needed to act. New York and WA's Live Lighter campaign have made a start, but with tiny budgets, it's a pin to stop a herd of elephants. Even health groups advocating to reduce obesity fall at the first hurdles. 
The messages aren't as straightforward as quid. It would be wrong to paint the entire food industry in the same colours as big tobacco. Among advocates, there isn't yet the same consensus we had on tobacco, and there just aren't many people involved in advocacy. Meantime, the processed food industry is massively funded, well coordinated, and as ruthless as big tobacco, and that's not surprising. There have historically been and remain close links between tobacco, alcohol, and food industries. The main difference is that big junk's even more powerful. Like tobacco, big tobacco, this industry sings siren songs. They profess concern about the problem. They want to be involved in policy discussions. They have voluntary marketing codes that don't address children's exposure to junk food promotion. They always talk about marketing to children rather than children's exposure. They ferociously oppose anything that might make a difference to their sales, from advertising curbs to effective labeling to taxes on sugary drinks. They love to talk about physical activity a great distraction from their products. They argue that it's about personal choice and that protecting children and the public from their predatory promotions interferes with our personal liberties and is a threat to democracy. And they even have the nerve to present themselves as health authorities. Believe it or not, there is a Coca-Cola Company Beverage Institute for Health and Wellness, <laughs> and Coca-Cola runs glossy media campaigns to convince us that they're part of the solution for everything from obesity to world peace. It's true. And they love choice. When Coca-Cola were criticised for their marketing of the Northern Territory, which they reportedly claimed had the highest per capita consumption rate of Coca-Cola in the world, they defended their role in remote communities, saying, we want to give people the choice. We want to be in there, helping to deliver the best health outcomes to these communities. The Food and Grocery Council say they want to help Australians, quote, make better diet and lifestyle choices leading to health and wellness. The AFGC promotes the scientific facts about food and good nutrition. They, quote, advocate sound nutritional principles based on a whole of diet approach rather than focusing on particular types of food. Too right. They don't want to focus on particular types of food, such as those their members produce. And too right, too, that the AFGC, a lobby organization representing the food, beverage, and grocery industry, wants to be seen as a reliable source of health information. And as we heard, too, just now, they want to claim the credit for safe food. But we have safe food because governments acted. And they acted before there was a food industry. In my state, Western Australia, the first public health legislation preventing the slaughtering of food in a town site was in 1842. There wasn't a big food industry then. The AFGC and its partners, like the equally health conscious people at PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Nestle and Sugar Australia, even have a program called Together Counts, with wonderfully incisive health advice, such as housework is a fantastic form of exercise. <laughs> Get the kids involved and challenge them to see who can finish their tasks first. Why on earth should we accept that the processed and junk food industries and their representatives are appropriate to provide any kind of advice on health matters? Why on earth should we give any credibility to their education programs or their proposals, for example, for soft, ineffective pack labelling? It simply doesn't make sense. The Director General of WHO recently said that it's not just big tobacco anymore. Public health must also contend with big food, big soda, and big alcohol. All of these industries fear regulation and protect themselves by using the same tactics. My view is that government should be using a lot of those tactics, mass media and other programs too. There's little evidence that governments of any colour, though, will take any serious action on obesity. They'll continue to involve the junk food industry in policy discussions, to run soft education programmes and to back off from any tough measures or to spend the money that's needed. The industry will continue to sing siren songs of cooperation, knowing that that's all just moonshine designed to fend off anything that might possibly impact on their sales. We'll continue to be a car and screen dominated society. Junk food and drink will continue to be cheap and tasty. Market forces will not stimulate the production of fresh fruit and vegetables, allowing them to be cheaper and more accessible. Promotion of junk food will continue unabated. Governments won't take on the processed and junk food industries. We'll continue to get fatter, and our children will face a shorter life expectancy. So my proposition to you is that we should not kid ourselves that there is any serious intent to tackle the problem or that soft measures will make any difference. Obesity is here to stay. Thank you. I think that was 20 minutes shoved into 10, don't you? <laughs> that man moves fast, and, and I know fast.
Told you he was cheerful. I told you he had a lovely message for you at the end there. Our final speaker, however, is, um, and I must make a personal declaration here, is a dear friend of mine. It's uh, Mr. Harold Mitchell, and he's the founder of Mitchell and Partners, chair of the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health. And he's speaking about the experience of lap band surgery because he's been there, he's done that, and he has the scar to prove it. He was awarded the Officer of the Order of Australia in 2004 for his services as benefactor and fundraiser in support of artistic and cultural endeavour, and he's run a hugely successful media company for many, many years. He holds a number of community roles, which I won't run through because they're simply too numerous to mention. He and I know each other well and have clashed swords before. I'll try and keep him at 10 minutes. He'll try and jerk my chain. Harold Mitchell. Thank you, for, uh, some, Virginia, for some of you who would know that we shared a microphone over many years uh, on the Drive program on, on the ABC, so I know the way that it works, that uh, at 10 seconds to 6, the news is going to come on no matter what, Virginia, and so no matter what we were doing, it gets cut off, and to the, the, the last speaker, not fair, he fitted 20 minutes into 10 minutes by speaking fast. <laughs> Can I say, uh, along with a couple of the speakers, that I'm absolutely thrilled to be, to be here too at the University of Melbourne for a number of reasons, and the Florey next door is one of them. But uh, can I say just this, uh, that I'm thrilled to be anywhere, because five years ago, it was pretty clear I was gonna die. And that was because, clever and all as I might have been, all the things that I've done in my life, uh, I was obese. Worse than that, there's another word which is, I tell you, the worst way to describe a fat person, you're morbidly obese. And that's just something dreadful, and I was all of that. Uh, I have five gra uh, grandchildren, and our, our daughter very cleverly would lend us a grandchild of a weekend. That's the way to get into the will without any trouble at all. <laughs> and, and when the, the, the little four-year-old said, uh, as they do, you would know this, uh, Grandpa, I was in the shower Sunday morning, can I look? They do that, you well know, it's like they do it in toilets and things like that. And, Can I look? I said, no, Alex, you can't. Grandpa, I'm looking. <laughs> Virginia knows she's got a little two-year-old and this is going to happen if not already. Grandpa, said this little voice, you've got two bellies. I knew I wouldn't see her grow up. And so with that, uh, from what, what we've heard here before, uh, from uh, 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 our, our um, Professor Joe Brigetti, if I got the name right, uh, the, the, it's in the genes, perhaps it is. I, I should say, Professor, I'm in real trouble there. My mother was fat, an alcoholic, mad and short. And <laughs> I was in real trouble. Uh, but for me, it was a different journey in every way. I had tried to lose weight, and I can. And we all do, and I did, over all of those years. And uh, uh, to, to Mike, uh, the happy professor, I might say, who said nothing will work, uh, I'm not a nothing at work person at all. Uh, I'd, put, I'd, I'd, I'd lose the weight and I'd put it back on again. It was simply my metabolism had reached the speed of a tree. It just wasn't there. And you're lucky, a lot of you look around at the thin people, you have metabolism. I'd really got mine all wrong. And so my experience is very simple. I'm gonna make four points, Virginia, and I've got six minutes left. Is uh, my journey with obesity, you've heard of it, uh, that I went up and down, up and down, up and, and so many in this room would know that's, that's exactly what happened. It happened with me and I finally, with uh, little Alex just teaching me that, and my daughter and a good friend of mine, Kerry Stokes, who just said, mate, you've got to do something about it, I knew I did. And so I had the lap band surgery. Now, people had heard about uh, stomach being stable. I mean, a uh, good mate of mine, Philip Adams, uh, Philip did that all those years ago. I thought, oh, I can't do that. But right now, there's a very, very very clever, uh, a very clever procedure, and one of the best people uh, in, a, in the world is here in Melbourne, and I was lucky enough to get in with that. And so for me, lap band surgery worked, and I was interested to hear some of the theories before uh, of where we're looking at it, and I think that I might be just the living proof of just what happens about eating, because uh, uh, the man that looked after me was, was very good, and he said, you know what's wrong with you? And I said, what is it? Uh, you know, I run, I do this, or whatever it was. He said, you eat too much, and that's how you get fat. You eat too much. Isn't that simple? And so what the lap band does, it simply means you, that you can't eat very much. Uh, I mean, you can be really stupid and cheat, and some people do. But the fact is that it works for me. My point today is quite simply this. As I, as I looked into it, I thought there's something wrong, wrong about all of this because uh, uh, as I was, um, uh, as, as I was uh, having my lap band done, uh, I'm just looking for a name of... Uh, 
someone at the same time as well. I lost it, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, as I, as I was having my lap band done, I, I jumped a queue, paid a lot of money, did what rich people do. Uh, but, but, but the sad thing is I found that if you, if you wanted it done in a public hospital, you had to wait three years. And in my case, I, I'd be dead. It would have all been over. So the, the thing is that nearly four million Australians are obese. You heard some of those stories, about half of whom rely on the public hospitals for their health care, and what a great problem all of that is. But less than 10% and probably less than 5% of current waste loss surgery in Australia is provided to the public patients. A sad, sad story. What is it? And in, in the, the, the final point I want to make is this. The failure to offer weight loss surgery to public patients leads to three problems. Firstly, it's bad health care. You know some of the figures what it all means. Right now, the cost of our health is enormous. It's $70 billion. There's a department in Canberra trying to spend $70 billion badly. It's called the health department. It's hardly got a doctor. You know the story. Many of you are professional here. It is failing, failing all of us so badly. It's bad health care. Secondly, it lacks equity. Why should I, because I got lucky enough to make a dollar or two, I didn't go down the path of my mother, although to be fair, uh, I am short, I was an alcoholic, and, uh, and I'm not mad. That was one thing I missed out on. So, but she was a good lady. She just happened to have all those problems. Of 23 million people, we exclude more than half of Australians from the great care that I had from her. And thirdly, it's bad economics. It's just as simple as that. It costs us money. Right now, you heard some of the figures before, 280, 280 people per day are getting diabetes. Over 1.7 million people right now. And by 2031, 3.3 million Australians will have diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and it is costing us $10.3 billion a year. That is clearly, clearly stupid. Unfortunately, I cannot agree with too many of our, our former speakers. I'd have to say about too many things, but for, uh, for Mike, who said, uh, if I summed it up, that nothing will work. Mike, that is one of the worst things I could imagine anyone hearing. It has to work. If 23 million Australians are going to have the greatest century that we've ever had, we've got to learn what to do. It's as simple as that. Let's not treat it lightly. Let's understand, too, it's very clever It's it, 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 what we need to do from here. Jane, uh, I, live, I live in your world uh, because uh, I'm in the ad business. I made a lot of things out of it. Sadly, I know if you cancel the ads, it won't make any difference. It just won't. It just isn't like that. I mean, nice, nice argument, nice try in every way like that. And Geoffrey, I felt bad because trying to apologise for something you can't apologise isn't right. So my proposition, not surprisingly, is simple. Those who have been unsuccessful in losing weight, which was me, should have the right to publicly access weight reduction surgery, which will save lives, provide for more equitable health, care and save money. How we go, Virginia? Right on time. Right on time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And he's brought us back on time. Well done. All right, now we're going to strike this, aren't we? Yep, I'm going to head back to my chair so we can do this. What we'll do in the meantime is bring our panellists up. Can you still hear me? We're still working. Excellent. OK, there's my mic. So our panellists, if I can call you back up onto the stage, I'm going to sit here. And uh, we'll take that from the stage. We're going to have a chat amongst ourselves, but also include you. We've got some roving mics in the audience. Stick your hand up, hold it up high, wait till you see me give you the nod, and I will come to you in some sort of order. Um, some things that we want to talk about as well, uh, but we'll include you in that. And then remember, at the end of that, we're going to um, be sort of live polling on the propositions that you heard from all of our speakers today. OK, and um, also a few tweets, if there's anything really worthwhile, Chief Tweeter, that you want to share with me, then just oh. you stick your hand up and let me know, and I'll read those out as well. OK, look, um, I can imagine, though, at this point, um, having started off and being pretty much beaten up by everybody else, um, Jeff, uh, you, you might want to say a few things, a few propositions that you've heard in those um, papers following you that perhaps you want to take issue with. Oh, look, I think, I think perhaps the... Um uh, I think one of the things for me is that there are no real obvious solutions to obesity. I think we had a National Preventive Health Task Force that reported in 2009, and one of the things they had to look at was obesity. They were unable to identify a single factor or even a group of factors that explained why we had such a problem with obesity. Um, they had a lot of suggestions about things that could be done, but it really is 
an intractable problem. Now, I've been working for the Food and Grocery Council for a number of years and for the food industry even longer than that, and I've done a lot of work in nutrition and, and food science. My view is that we do have to have, um, well, a multifaceted approach. One of the problems is it's the food industry that's held up as the bad boy on the block, but I'll just say one thing, you know, we don't call these or we don't call obesity and the associated illnesses, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, we don't call them food related diseases. We call them lifestyle related diseases. So there are whole aspects of our lifestyle and that perhaps was the theme that the National Preventive Health Task Force report pointed out. That it's, it's a factor of our lifestyle and until we start addressing it uh, holistically with a whole number of measures and the food industry is certainly keen to be part of the debate and do what it can to in, in this struggle then we won't solve it you know simplistic measures about making and drawing uh, analogies simplistic analogies between the food industry now and the tobacco industry in the 1950s um, I don't think they advance the debate at all because obviously food is quite different from tobacco. Well, uh, Mike, do, do you want to jump in there because you clearly do see analogies between the two? If, uh, and you use a particular phrase. You say big junk. Yeah, um, three things for me. First is just a quick comment in terms of what Harold said, and I absolutely don't argue against the value of surgery and I did comment on that, but it's not a community solution, it's not a population solution. It will always take its place in the battle for health resources, and what we need is action on prevention, and that's what I'm depressed about. So I'm not depressed about advancing, so that's the first point. Second point is, Geoffrey said, the uh, National Preventive Health Task Force, which was chaired by Rob Moody of this university, I was the deputy chair, said we didn't come up with, this, with strategies. We actually did. The trouble is, he didn't like them. But that's different. And the government did go with what we went with on tobacco. They're not the same. Tobacco and obesity aren't the same, but there are a huge range of similarities. And as Margaret Chan of WHO has said, and one of them is that, one of the similarities is that you don't allow the fox into the chicken coop. You don't have the people who are helping to promote the problem, helping you to develop the solutions. So we have a massive problem. We need action on it. And the reason I'm so depressed is not because of surgery, not because of research, but because of the arguments that these guys use that are so powerful with governments. Jane, do you want to jump in there? Well, I think, um, I mean, I come from a tobacco control background and I think there are a lot of similarities and the big, the big problem is we need to make these environmental changes. I mean, the way we improved the food supply was to regulate. That's how we have fresh water. That's why we have, you know, milk without diseases in it. And we do need to regulate. It creates a level playing field. The companies that are doing the right thing, they'll benefit. Um, the community in the longer term will benefit and I think the community is starting to rise up. We do have a Minister for Health who's also the Minister for Sport so I would like him to see, you know, getting junk food out and I'm, interesting, I'm interested to hear an ad man say that advertising basically doesn't work. Um, you know, I, I do believe that we need to get rid of this sort of promotion of junk food. We do need to increase the price of things like sugary drinks. Uh, we do need to look at re product reformulation and put in some um, really strong measures to make sure that we lower the levels of salt, fat, sugar in foods. And, and industry is very much in the, in the box seat. And I think that is a huge, huge problem. Um, some hands up for questions so I can just get you in order and then we'll come to you. Is it uh, someone in the centre just here and then um, up the back just there, we'll go to after that. And uh, then I think there was one up the barrel at the back there, yeah, and one there on the aisle. So that's one, two and three. We'll just come to this first one in a second. But Joe, I, I did want to hear from you because listening to, to your, you know, much more medically based, biologically based um, assertion today, um, and tell me if I'm over-interpreting here, you would even seem to suggest that, that no, advertising and marketing and what's in the sugary drinks or not doesn't really matter because, because it is to some extent predetermined but, but triggered, triggered environmentally. The way that obesity, uh, sorry, food causes obesity is not only through the calories it supplies. A as I showed you with that rat study, it can also alter gene expression. Yep. Now, if we... We cannot go back to a situation where we have deficiency of food. We don't want to be hungry again like we used to be. So food will be always with us. What we need to find, in my view, is what are those epigenetic triggers? In that 
high fructose uh, sweetened condensed milk diet that we gave, that, that Barry Levin gave to his rats, there would be some sugars or some uh, fats that may be doing the epigenetic imprinting. Right. It would be more research will identify maybe one or two sugars. So you think it will actually come down to that kind of food? I hope so, because because if we don't find that, if it's energy in general that causes the problem, yeah. then we're in trouble. Yeah. Because we're never going to be deficient in food, whether it's marketed or not, it's there, yeah. right? Uh, now, let me tell you one other thing. One of the hormones I flashed up very quickly that comes from fat called leptin. You've all heard of leptin. Leptin is made in fat cells. Leptin inhibits food intake very powerfully. And it, it is therefore a negative feedback signal. Yeah. So if, you, if you're genetically skinny and you're in an obesogenic environment, you'll start to put on a few kilos of fat because you, you're eating more than you're burning. But as you accumulate fat, you make more and more leptin, which then feeds back and inhibits your food intake. So just uh, 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 the food alone can make you a little bit overweight, but it won't make you fat. You need something else to go on to make you fat, and that's the genes, whether it's a sequence problem or an epigenetic problem. Okay. We'll go to our question here. You should have the mic by now. Is it coming over? <coughs> yep. Okay. Um, hi. I'm a little nervous, but I just wanted Speak to... Speak up, please. Hello. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone because you guys all spoke so well and I learned so much, but I just have two questions that are, like, really... I'll let you have one question. Okay. Um, okay. Well, they're kind of really related. So I was just thinking about epigenetics, which I had actually recently read about. And my thought is that if, if, for instance, your mother ate really badly, and as a result, from the epigenetic tags that she's that have latched onto her DNA, you become obese, or you have the genes that behave badly that make you obese. Can you then, even if you are fat and you live a, a life being fat, eat the foods that change your genetic makeup to have children who are then healthier and who have better, better lifestyles. Okay. So it's... Yep. Uh, most of the epigenetic uh, imprints, if you like, are removed when, this, when you, you make sperm and egg uh, in my, what's called meiosis. So that you do have a, a, a chance of removing those epigenetic triggers for the next generation. That, that means that, yes, the next generation possibly can avoid it, provided they avoid the same uh, environmental insult that happened before. Um, so it can be. Whether we can... We can't chemically reverse those epigenetic, not at the moment anyway, and I don't think ever, because a lot of epigenetic imprinting is part of normal biology. And, and so we would have very rough tools to be able to remove these, these uh, chemical imprints on genes. So you really have to wait for the next generation, I think, when, when nature does it. OK. Before I get to the next question, Harold, um, do you want to just pick up uh, Jane's you know, challenge to you that, OK, you, you acknowledged today that, um, that uh, advertising doesn't work. Is that what you were saying? Or were you saying that <laughs> junk food is something else altogether? Well, well I, I wouldn't say, Jane, uh, generally, of course, because it does. And, uh, <laughs> And, and that, that's the truth of the matter. But I just don't think it will in this case because uh, I, I'm the one person here that's been through all of this. I mean, you've, you've been studying all of the form elsewhere, but I was 165 kilos and now I'm 90. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a living example of just what's going on inside me and what will go on inside other people. And so that doesn't make any... The advertising, if I was to see it, it wouldn't make any change to me. My grandkids wouldn't make any change to them. But... Of course, advertising works. Uh, it, it can change the way we think. You think of, uh, of people wearing seatbelts and, and, and helmets um, uh, for, for, for bikes and such like, and it was the seatbelt campaign that really is a great example of what it works from there. So, Virginia, so, so. yes, of course, it can work, uh, but there's much more to do at a much deeper level than all of that. So uh, I wouldn't say give up. But it's not going to be the answer. Just as no, no one thing here is the answer. In the case of my, my lap band, that's equally we shouldn't put a lap band on everybody. That of course isn't the case. Uh, that, but, but those where it's a real problem, I sit on a board next to a fellow called James Packer. You know what happened with that? And I ran into hockey, Joe Hockey, at an airport. And so it, they fought it their whole life. It can make a difference, and we shouldn't get rid of it. The other interesting thing, I should say, just to finalise Virginia, is that um, we, we talk about what it is that makes you hungry and which little part inside. Now, 
in my case, it's amazing, and the, the professor who has been looking after me, Paul O'Brien, you'd know, I, I think we're finding something because I actually don't feel hungry. There was a time before where there was never enough food in the world for me to eat, uh, but uh, it just there's something about the little chemical that this has caused that, that gets up there that says that isn't the case. We're finding out more as we go, I think. Do you want to make a comment on that? Well, in the ban, all operative procedures work by reducing hunger. With the ban, it's be as Paul O'Brien has shown, is that when the food goes through a, the, the gullet yeah. and it gets squeezed, the wall gets squeezed, a message goes up the, the, the a fall. nerve called yeah. the vagus nerve that yeah. then yeah. suppresses hunger. That's the ver nerve yeah. that's missing in my Labrador dog. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Um, I'd rather back here. Ah. Hi. Um, do you think that there's a link at all between factory farming and obesity in that people are able, because it's so cheap, to eat more and more meat? So make food expensive and we'll all get skinny. Well, is, is it... Can I, I, I will definitely come to you, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, Joe, but I'd also like to hear from you as well. It's interesting you mentioned meat. Uh, there's some research originally done on insects, believe it or not, that we, we eat protein up to a certain level. Protein is more satiating. I, I don't think it's meat that makes you fat, uh, per se. Mark? Yeah, I, I'd find it hard to specify factory farming as a, as a specific issue here. Um, can I just make a, a slightly broader couple of points? First, um, it, it's sometimes risky to personalise and then to broaden that out to the entire community, you know, to broaden this personal experience out to the entire community. Um, otherwise, for example, I would be saying to you that short people of Jewish extraction are always campaigners. Well, they're not. Um, <laughs> a lot of them are. A lot of them are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, All but, of them are. <laughs> but um, actually, Nicola yeah. Roxon, Michael Bloomberg, yeah, maybe they are. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the <laughs> couple of points I want to make on this. First is in terms of how we see advertising, there is a huge amount of evidence showing that kids and adults are influenced by advertising, but the reverse apply, the, the other side applies. And, you know, we have here in Harold, frankly, one of the most powerful people in the country. And if he could persuade the government to spend more on tough advertising about food in the same way that worked so well on seatbelts and immunisation, on HIE AIDS, yeah, on tobacco, okay. I think that would make a huge difference. And the other point I want to make is, you know, I'm naturally an optimist. I don't want to sound depressed. But the reality, really? not really, but, but I just look at this big problem mm. and I just don't see answers to it. And that's why I'm taking that, in a sense, negative approach, because we know a lot of what needs to be done. I just cannot see it happening in this area. Jeff? Well, actually, I was going to um, respond to the factory farming question. Obviously, mm. factory farming has made um, food cheaper, and particularly protein-rich foods cheaper. So chicken meat, for example, is, is the classic, where it's, it's now a very cheap form of protein relative to how it was 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, to link into the, the comment was, which was made about the insects, it's been demonstrated that insects eat to a protein appetite, but that's not the only class of animal that eats to a protein appetite. It's been demonstrated in many others. And so it would be, if anything, factory farming would tend to work the other way. If people find it easier to meet a protein appetite through having cheap available protein sources, they are less likely to overeat. Jeff, while you're speaking and I've got you, you mentioned as part of your talk about Kellogg's taking out all the sodium yeah. of its own breakfast cereal, which was a, a phenomenal amount, and, and removing that from the diets of, uh, of so many Australians and others. Following that logic then, and, and sticking with, I guess, the optimistic view of what c can be done rather than what can't be done, doesn't it logically follow then that Kellogg's and others would be able to then extract all the sugar they're putting in food? Yeah. Well, well, I'd make... I'd make, uh, I'd make two points about that. First of all, there is very little evidence that suggests that sugar is a risk-associated nutrient any more than any other carbohydrate. Are you mad? No, I'm not mad. <laughs> no, I'm not mad. I'm not mad. In fact, in fact I can even... I've got to myself a ranked fact, amateur here, but, but even fact, I think I've read that it is. In, in fact, um, there was a study that came out of Otago University at the beginning of this year which demonstrated that sugar, certainly it's a source of calories, but no more than any other carbohydrate. And anybody who's actually studied classic nutrition understands that. Now, there isn't, there's, 
I mean, that is simply what the scientific literature says at the moment. And even the review of the dietary guidelines doesn't actually identify any particular health um, problems associated and with sugar, above and beyond the fact that it is a source of energy. Okay, I think everyone in this room wants okay. to respond to that. And so, well, but, you, but, they, your, but your second point, you said there was two things. Well, clearly, foods have been modified in terms of their formulation over the years, and companies continue to do it. But ultimately, companies, I mean, the, the, the foods still have to taste reasonable, otherwise consumers won't buy them. Yeah. Now, we have had, I mean, the classic example is salt. We've had reductions in salt going on at the behest of the medical industry and because the food industry does want to respond. So now in Australia, for example, if you look at something like the, the sodium standards that were set for salt in, in the UK, the 2010 sodium standards when they were set, you know, 70%, 77% of Australian breakfast cereals in 2010 were reported by the George Institute at the University of Sydney that they met that standard. So, you know, it's just unfair. It, well, not only it is unfair, it's just not correct when we say that the food industry is not responding to these problems, that mainstream food products are not being altered in directions which are determined by okay. uh, the advice that comes from the medical. Does anyone want to respond to the sugar assertion? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, l l let me come to you. Uh, can I just um, say that the Australian Dietary Guidelines, which were recently released, most of the guidelines talk about sugar and sugary drinks have been reviewed by the National Health and Medical Research Council and found to be associated with overweight and obesity in adults and in children. So there was a very strong announcement about that in the guidelines um, to say to people that sugar-sweetened beverages, uh, soft drinks um, are a problem. And they also talked about highly processed carbohydrate type foods like pastries and, and we were very specific about the kinds of foods that shouldn't be eating. If we ate a healthy diet, there'd be no room in our energy limits for discretionary foods, basically. But sugar was certainly pulled out in the dietary guidelines because of the evidence. Mike? I just want to say that you know, I thank Geoffrey for making the point to me that the food industry is not the group from whom we should be taking our advice on health. <laughs> I, I'll come to you, sir. There was a one a question on the aisle. No, it was this gentleman here, actually. I'm sorry about that, mate, but uh, to be fair, give the microphone back. <laughs> this one here, uh, then I'm coming to you. Was there another? I know there's millions. And uh, young lady here in blue, that's where we're going to next. Go ahead. Yeah, my comment is to Geoffrey. Um, I thank you and your industry for over the years you've made food safer and as you say, you made it cheaper, I can perhaps believe that, but I think there's a price to pay for that. Initially, we had too much fat in it. When you came to the party on that, there's too much sugar. And I strongly disagree with you that diabetes is, the increase in diabetes is not caused by too much sugar in soft drinks and other foods. And Sir, I need you to come to a question yes. rather than a speech. My challenge to you is, that on your advisory board that alters food, you are not, don't have a majority of your own industry governing your own self-interest, that you put an equal number of knowledgeable people in the food interests that, ha in the food industry, academics, etc., that have no vested interest. I would say that you would not be game to do that and you wouldn't want to because the profits that you want to okay. make, your industry wants to make, is at the expense of people not living long enough and you don't care about us. All right. We'll leave it there. We get your point. Yes. Uh, my question is particularly to Jane and to Mike. Uh, it seems that we've pretty much uh, agreed that uh, obesity is a lifestyle uh, issue uh, and that uh, food uh, diet is a, is a large component of that. Uh, and I guess our, our lifestyle is also largely influenced by advertising. Uh, I find it hard to accept that millions of dollars are spent uh, by these companies without, uh, without effect. Um, so to intervene in that really seems to depend on, on some, uh, some government uh, regulation and intervention as, as occurred with smoking and uh, with uh, reducing the road toll where Victoria has in many ways led the world. Can you come to a question please? Yeah. What, what will it take uh, for government to uh, be motivated to uh, intervene in, uh, in this issue, given the, uh, the, the long time delay and uh, current lack of community support for such intervention. Okay. Do you want to start, Jane? Um, I think it will take 
The main thing is political will and leadership. That is the main issue. So like we've seen in New York with Bloomberg, like we saw with Nicola Roxon around tobacco, we need someone who will stand up to the food industry, who won't invite them to the table, who will develop policy based on evidence and then implement it together with industry, but that it's developed independent of industry. And you'll note with the Preventative Health Task Force recommendations, which are around a comprehensive approach, a lot of the tough ones haven't been implemented. So, so the easy steps that aren't contentious with industry have been taken, pushed some things, pushed a little bit further, but the harder ones haven't been happened. And that does take a champion, that takes political will. I think in Victoria with these Healthy Together communities, we are seeing some community action and there will be pressure from the bottom up on government because communities are now being funded to do what they can, except the Planning Act or the other sort of regulatory arrangements can be disincentives and can undermine their work. And I think that's, I think we'll get more community pressure um, coming and I, I sort of feel a sense of change in Victoria through this COAG funding. All right. Um, just before, I want to hear from Joe and, and Mike and, and Harold as well on, on that too, and we'll come back to Jeff. But just before I do, just to let you know, at this point, you can turn your phones on if you have them off and, uh, and think about uh, voting for the uh, assertion uh, of all of our speakers today that for you, according to you, has its the highest priority, uh, which of the ideas they've brought to the table that to you matter the most. What you'll be doing when the uh, screen comes up, you'll be texting... Uh, You'll be sending a text to that number that's up there or to the website pollev.com backslash UOM festival. Uh, and we'll be doing that in just a few moments. That will come up on the screen. When it does, you can vote. And you'll see there'll be a special code that correlates to each idea on the side. And then you send the text to that number. And we'll see the results in the next couple of minutes. Joe. Well, look, I think I'm afraid that your primary premise is I disagree with. Obesity is not just due to lifestyle. I, I thought I'd shown you the evidence for that. So what follows is wrong. Do you, do you, do you therefore believe then that, that any sort of organised community action is doomed to fail or, or is pointless? No, what, what I think is we, need, we urgently need more knowledge, more research onto what is it that is changing these yeah. genes expression. Rather than using public money on campaigns that might be misdirected? Well, the campaigns, the problem with the campaigns is they will not re remove food from our society and we don't want that to happen anyway. Yeah, okay. Uh, pushing, uh, look, I'm not in favour of pushing high sugar, high fat foods to kids. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. There's no need for that. But it's, if we think that that's the only problem and that will survive, you know, that will correct the problem, it won't. Okay. Mike? Um, my slightly flip answer to your question, what will it take, is 50 years, okay? And that's because it will take that amount of time for there to be sufficient community concern out there. Second answer is just sometimes you find a politician with clout who's tough enough to take an issue on and to push it through. If we get that, then we're doing really well. My third point is that I'm a bit depressed at an approach that says, essentially, it's only research, don't bother about doing other things, because that's the way it sort of came across. And I'm all for more research. But obesity isn't something that's been, it, it's, it, the rise in obesity has been over the last two or three decades. We do actually know there is a heap of evidence about what will work as part of a comprehensive program, both in this area and inferential research from other areas. So, as you'll have gathered, I'm pretty depressed about the opportunities for things to happen in the shortish term. The one thing that I would hang my hat on is finding a politician, doesn't matter what party, sometimes politicians of the right can do more because they don't bother to consult, they just make things happen. Um, doesn't matter which party, is finding a politician with the guts to take this issue on and to take on the food industry. Harold, um, do you want to reflect on that? I mean, you have seen the success and the failure of, you know, public education campaigns and marketing mm. campaigns and the like. Mm. Uh, can you see the need for it and well, what it will I, take? Well, I was just fascinated watching the research coming up. I have to tell you, just, <laughs> just to see the, the mood of the people, which is one of academia. You can, you can see clearly that. Uh, I, I would say this. What, what, I, what I found out through my experience is quite simply that there, all of these people here today and all of you 
know that we have a, an unbelievably serious problem. And what I've found out is that there is so much that we don't know. And I agree with the, my good friend on my left, it will take a long time, uh, but we need to go down that path. I, I have a very simple answer. It is too simplistic by far, I understand that. Uh, but we just need to do it, and, and that would be the very simple part of it. Jeff, would you like to make a, a last comment on all of this today? I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the last word, and I'm afraid we have no more time for questions. I'm sorry. Um, well, um, I've been debating obesity and the relationship between food and health for a long, long time. I mentioned already my background in terms of food technology. One of the things that convinced me to come into this was uh, when I had an opportunity to go to university. My mother said, uh, do something about food because there'll always be a job for you. Little did I understand that a lot of that would be spent having the same arguments over and over again about uh, obesity. But I'd like to just say that um, there are plenty of examples of food companies that are doing very well and the food industry is engaged in this. And you will have noticed that one of the things, one of the differences between the way I present my information is that I do encourage you to go out and look at the information yourself. This isn't really about competing philosophies. It should be about um, evidence and working together to, to try and look at what is essentially an intractable problem. However, it may not be as intractable as we think because there is already evidence that the rising levels of obesity or the levels of obesity in the instance of them are, are plateauing. Um, certainly that's the case in, the, in children in Australia from the evidence that's been published recently. And there, is, and there are, and there are I, be, I believe I've got the uh, stage, thanks Mike. Um, and, uh, and uh, it's the same in the US with adults. So, you know, I think the things that have been uh, advocated are beginning to work, and it's a combination of, of many things, including the food industry playing its part. OK. Look, uh, that's all we have time for, and you can see that the winning proposition by a significant margin is Mike's. Uh, please thank our panellists today, won't you? Harold Mitchell, Jeffrey Anderson, Jay Martin, Joe Proietto and Mike Dorff.